The K1200R, one of the most powerful motorcycles ever built by the Bayerische Motoren Werke. The company also known as BMW. They go back way to the early part of the century, so um, they were one of the pioneers. Pioneers who first dreamt of flying. BMW started as an aircraft engine company in the First World War. But after the war, BMW needed a new business. In 1923, they decided to produce a motorcycle. Forty years later, they almost quit. BMW in the late 60s almost stopped producing motorcycles. But BMW couldn't quit. They had become obsessed with innovation and engineering. BMW has led technology, and they have in cars, and they have in bikes, and you always wonder what next year is going to bring from BMW. BMW's unique designs earned a reputation for reliability. Back in the 50s, everything broke frequently, and BMWs broke far less than everything else. BMW also built a reputation for combining craftsmanship with technology. Old war craftsmanship plus the high tech thing. And I think BMW blends those two things really well. A blend that is uniquely Bavarian. You see a motorcycle, you know what it's for, you know what kind of riding you want to do with that bike. You can see what's unique about the motorcycle. Why did BMW start and then almost stop making motorcycles? How did they become fixated on innovation? And what does all their new technology mean to the motorcycle world? part to Kirchen, a fairy tale town in the Bavarian Alps. The town is more than 1,100 years old. It sits below the Zugspitze, the highest mountain in Germany, its summit rising 10,000 feet from the valley floor. Less than two hours from Munich, Bavaria is where BMW motorcycles were born. What would become BMW was originally the Rapp Motor Works, a Bavarian company founded by a young German engineer in 1913. In 1916, the company changed its name to BMW. Its focus was on the blue skies above Bavaria. The company built airplane engines, not motorcycles. BMW started as an aircraft engine company in the First World War. 
One of BMW's first innovations was a new fuel system for airplanes that allowed them to fly higher than ever before. In 1919, a BMW-powered plane set the world altitude record of 32,000 feet. But the end of World War I was almost the end of BMW. After the war in Germany, it was not longer allowed to produce uh, aircrafts and aircraft engines. Unable to make airplane engines, BMW was on the verge of going out of business. They rebuilt part of their factory but lost money trying to make brake systems for trains. But they knew how to make great engines and got the idea to build a new motor and then put it into a motorcycle. And BMW needs uh, at this time a new business in 1923 they decide to produce a motorcycle. Turning desperation into action, BMW told one of their young engineers, Max Fritz, to design a motorcycle. It was something he had never done before. He was a genius with aircraft design, so they took the risk that he might be able to do the same with motorcycles. Max Fritz, he was responsible for the aircraft engines in the First World War. And he decided to design a motorcycle with the same quality as the aircraft engines at this time. That's the beginning of the BMW motorcycle history. To escape the company's sense of financial doom and gloom, Max left Munich. Locking himself away in a small Bavarian cottage, he worked day and night. And in an unbelievable four short weeks, he emerged with plans that would prove to be BMW's salvation. A motorcycle called the R32. Nothing like it existed in the 1920s. It was the first real motorcycle. The R32 was a revolutionary motorcycle. It had a unique engine, two pistons laid flat 180 degrees apart. The technical name was a twin cylinder, horizontally opposed, four stroke engine. BMW nicknamed the design a boxer. And the first BMW didn't have a bicycle type chain connected to the rear wheel like other motorcycles of the time. Instead, it had a drive shaft the same thing that connects a motor to the wheels in a car. They look a little funky at first, but I think that design, which goes way back, is pretty endearing after a while. And functionally, it's superb. Eventually, the engine layout and shaft drive of the very first BMW would become known as typically BMW because both designs are still being used today. The basic uh, underlying design stayed the same and uh, I think it just it's a design that grows on you. BMW's innovative designs were made famous by a man named Ernst Henne, one of the greatest motorcycle racers ever. In 1929, he broke the first record for BMW. It was about 216 kilometers per hour in, uh, here near Munich on a normal road. Two hundred and sixteen kilometers an hour equals 134 miles an hour on a motorcycle in 1929. You can jump on the Autobahn today and go uh over 100 miles an hour, 120, 130, 140, and it'll definitely get your attention. But to have done it 70 years ago on a bike with antiquated tires and suspension, shocking to even think about. The 1929 speed record of 134 miles an hour changed everything for BMW. It was the beginning of a BMW role as a global player and not a small Munich company. So I think Anstene was very important for BMW's motorcycle and company's history.
From 1926 until 1937, Hene shattered speed record after speed record, and BMWs became famous as the fastest motorcycles in the world. Ernst Henne made 76 speed records on the motorcycles, and the last one was in uh, 1937, and he rode about 204 miles per hour. Five years after its first motorcycle, BMW began building cars. In 1928, they licensed a British design and built what they called the Dixie. The first true BMW automobile was named the 315. It came out in 1935. The 315 had a top speed of 60 miles an hour. A BMW motorcycle called the R51, also built in 1935, could go 125 miles an hour. In terms of technology, BMW motorcycles were still light years ahead of their cars. In the late 30s, they have a new technology for welding the frames. So the motorcycles went more sporty. For example, the R51 with um, 500cc sports engines were very successful. During his life, Ernst Henney witnessed a huge shift in the motorcycle world. Before World War II, motorcycles were solely used for daily transportation. After World War II, everything would begin to change. By the 1960s, many people in Europe could afford cars, and motorcycles were no longer being used for transportation. Now, they were used for sport and fun. BMW figured out how to provide both with a new line of motorcycles. At the end of the 60s, you have all these 750cc bikes on the market, like Honda, like the Italian brands, and also BMW offered new motorcycle line, the so-called Slash 5 series. The Slash 5 series was an instant success. I bought an R75 slash 5, and I changed my entire attitude about, you know, the dependability of motorcycles. And so I quit my job and spent three years riding it around the world. This series was very successful uh, in the first year. We have more than 10,000 motorcycles a year, and the business grew up year over year. By the late 1960s, BMW was making more money selling cars than motorcycles. Forced into the motorcycle business in 1923, ironically, BMW was now thinking about quitting. Interestingly, a BMW in the late 60s almost stopped producing motorcycles. Uh, the plan was they were so successful of the cars that they said, well, you know, these motorcycles aren't, you know, selling as well as cars, we'll stop. But BMW didn't stop. Instead, they kept building bikes. One reason was that BMW had become the motorcycle of choice for law enforcement agencies around the world. In the 60s, more than 100 countries used BMWs as uh, police bikes, and it was also um, a foot in the door for new markets in the world. As BMW expanded its market reach, it continued to build new bikes. The company focused its efforts on evolution not revolution. Often we talk about evolution or revolution. People think of revolution as being big steps. That would be for me throwing out everything you had and starting with something new. BMW kept using its flat two-cylinder boxer engine, evolving it through the years with technical advances that kept making it more powerful. 
and BMW continued to use the drive shaft instead of a chain. In fact, they were about to produce what the world would call Germany's sexiest superbike. In October of 1973, BMW chose the Paris International Motorcycle Show to reveal its latest design to the world. A breakthrough design called the R90S. The special model was the R90S, a very fine piece of motorcycle design. It was the first BMW available to the public that had a top speed of 125 miles an hour. Not only the top speed at this bike was uh, fantastic, it was the average speed, for example, on a long race track like the uh, Nürburgring in Germany. That was the, the unofficial test track of uh, motorcycle journalists at this time. And uh, R90S with uh, 67 horsepower uh, was faster than other bikes with uh, 80 horsepower or more. The R90S was full of engineering innovations. It was the first BMW to have a separate speedometer and tachometer. It had the first steering dampener, a device that reduced shaking when the front wheel hit a bump. And it was the first BMW with holes drilled in the disc brakes to save weight, keep the brakes cool, and make the bike stop faster. You find it all over the years in in the BMW motorcycle model. So you have this uh, boxer engine, this opposed twin engine. You have the shaft drive to the rear wheel. These are two typical BMW features. You find it at the R32 in the 20s. You find it, find it in the bikes in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 70s, in the sports models like R90S in the 70s. BMW's first real sport bike, I know their, their bikes had been performance oriented prior to that, but that was really the bike that said to the American audience, in addition to the Europeans, um, this is a bike that's meant to go fast and go around corners pretty well and, and really do it all, but it definitely had a sporting bent. The R90S struck a chord with American motorcyclists. They clearly saw it as a new and very exciting bike. And a guy comes by on an R90S and it's, you know, it's got the shape it's got and the cylinders just sticking out. And you look at it, it makes this sound that doesn't sound like other motorcycles, and you look at it and you go, that's something different, isn't it? For me, anyway, it was one of the bikes that kind of ignited my interest and informed me of the difference between motorcycles at a very early age. It was great. It was very a very sort of different move in a different direction as sport bikes go. And um, of course, it developed into being one of the public's favorite bikes. The R90S had a dual racing seat and a special cowling around the headlight. Each R90S was hand painted, so no two bikes would ever look exactly the same. But every R90S shared the classic BMW design philosophy. It was the whole concept. It's like a little bit like the R32. It's not only a fast engine into a frame and some brakes on it. It was the, the whole concept, one piece of motorcycle that was very successful. While the R90S was engineered for speed, it came out years after BMW had stopped fielding a factory race team. But that didn't keep private riders from taking the bike racing. In 1976, Reg Pridmore, then a young British racer, won the first American motorcycle championship on a BMW R90S. The young Brit was living the American dream. As a kid, grew up loving everything I saw in American movies. Sh shooting cowboys and angels. It goes on, but I used to, I really was a hard working person. And I heard that um, if you worked hard in America, you got someplace, and uh, I really had that intention. Pridmore had some serious help. First, a BMW dealer in the US sponsored him. Then, the dealer spent $250,000 to soup up the bike. They hired an engineer from NASA to tune the engine, and by the time it was done, Pridmore's race-ready R90S put out an amazing 100 horsepower. As far as the power and the brakes and the handling at the time, they were adequate. 
uh, you could always make things better, which we did. That's pretty amazing. I mean, the, you know, it wasn't without a considerable amount of tuning, but, uh, you know, boy, they, they changed a, a lot of stuff to make that happen. But uh, the very fact that you could make it happen speaks to the fundamental capability of the bike. The factory had no idea what Pridmore was up to until he began winning races all over America. The factory actually wanted to know what the hell we were doing, winning races with these things, and they wanted to trade us one bike for two of their racers, and uh, we politely declined, simply because we had so much development going into this thing, it was sort of like our secret, you know? The whole series in 1976 with the uh, R90S, and it was a sensation because people said, oh, with a BMW, you won against these Japanese bikes, that people can't understand that BMW produce sporty bikes. But after this, they know it. <laughs> people was worried about the cylinder heads touching the ground and things like that. So you really had to learn how to become an extension of the motorcycle. There's a lot of really good riders that had a lot more respect for BMW when they saw what they could produce. And at that time we were making reasonably good horsepower, which is kind of funny right nowadays, talking about 100 horsepower. But uh, it was good, we had fun, and it's a part of my history. The R90S was a major breakthrough for BMW. The challenge now, what could the company do next to keep the momentum going? As it turned out, the answer was blowing in the wind. By the mid-1970s, BMW motorcycles faced a serious challenge. They desperately needed a new design that would make their bikes more modern. In 1976, BMW found the answer with another technological first, a new bike called the R100 RS, the first production motorcycle in the world that came straight from the factory with complete bodywork called a full fairing. In 1976, BMW, the R100 RS, it was the first motorcycle that the fairing was tested in a wind channel. It was absolutely the first bike and it was a motorcycle that tested in the wind tunnel for a long, long time to make this fairing perfect. If you have a look on it, there are a lot of details that have been absolutely new at this time. The R100 RS made its debut at the Cologne Motorcycle Show in 1976. It stunned the audience because its handlebars, switches, and instruments were all integrated into the new fairing. It was a milestone in motorcycle history, so it was a, also a whole concept, a whole bike, and not a fairing and a motorcycle. It was a motorcycle with fairing. A fairing where form followed function. Its shape determined in the same Italian wind tunnel that Ferrari used to shape its sports cars. However, despite all the advancements of the R100 RS, by the end of the 1970s, BMW needed something exciting to put on display at the Frankfurt Motorcycle Show. Its answer was to combine a street bike and a dirt bike into a new type of motorcycle, the Enduro. BMW called the new bike the R80 GS. The R80's launched the bike that will do anything. <laughs> I mean, it'll do anything. It'll be a great commuter. It's fantastic on the pavement. Great in the twisties. Unbelievably good in the twisties, those adventure bikes. The GS and the R80 GS name tag comes from the German Gelandestrasse, meaning road and street. You could ride the bike on anything from the Autobahn to a dirt farm road. In 
Even though the first R80GS was really just a collection of pieces from the factory parts bins, it had a remarkable success in one of the most challenging off-road races anywhere. The famous Paris-Dakar Rally, 6,068 miles across some of the toughest terrain in the world. BMW went to the Paris-Dakar event the beginning of the 80s and won it uh, four times between 1981 and 1985. So uh, you see this was a, a perfect bike for on-road and off-road at this time. It's got a great racing history and what it did, what the R80GS did was launch a whole bunch of people off the road into the dirt, up the, up the deserted uh, dirt highway that, that, that cuts over the mountain. And you can do that on a GS. The GS was a stopgap model that surprised BMW with its sales success and started a whole new category of motorcycles called adventure bikes you could drive the thing across Africa, which so many people did. Great big, huge gas tank, aggressive tires, lots of suspension, big wide handlebars, uh, bulletproof reliability. That's a good package. Larger, more powerful versions of the original R80GS are still being sold. The latest version is called the R1200GS. It has a bigger boxer engine with 100 horsepower. The GS is one of the most popular series of BMWs ever made. Total production topped a quarter of a million bikes by the end of 2007. If I could only have one motorcycle at the moment, just one, as I now have three, uh, it would be the R1200 GS, just because it's good for distance, it's good for dirt roads, and it's just fun to ride. While the GS line surprised everyone, the real shock about to come out of BMW headquarters was a drastic change in both design and tradition. The classic boxer engine was about to be replaced with a four-cylinder motor nicknamed the Flying Brick. Well, the Flying Brick, as they called it, that really was a huge, just a huge departure. It just seemed like, oh, here's the future of motorcycling. In the early 1980s, BMW decided it needed a bike with more power than it could get from the classic two-cylinder air-cooled boxer engine. It decided to build a four-cylinder liquid-cooled engine, something the company had never done before. What a shock. The world had grown up with opposed twins, air-cooled, and all of a sudden, here comes this uh, rather industrial-looking liquid-cooled four-cylinder. In 1983, BMW showed the world the K100, a motorcycle with a four-cylinder engine placed sideways in the frame. The K100 was more revolution than evolution, and the BMW faithful were frantic. They feared the new engine meant BMW would stop producing its classic boxer motor. In 1983, exactly 60 years after the presentation of the R32, the presentation of the K100 uh, was a little bit woo, like a crime. We bring a new concept. People say BMW is boxer, engine. Will people, will the customer around the world, will they accept the K-Series as a real BMW motorcycle? Time brought both praise and compromise. The K100 won Motorcycle of the Year awards around the world and people began buying it. At the same time, BMW decided to keep its classic boxer engine in production. But it was the K-Bike that took the lead in terms of innovation. It was the first BMW motorcycle to have a digital electronic system. 
Like BMW cars, it used fuel injection and had a catalytic converter to reduce pollution. But the biggest news from digital electronics was the first anti-lock brake system ever put on a bike. Simply called ABS, people had no idea if it would really work. And there was only one way to find out. I was fortunate enough to be invited to the press launch of BMW's ABS K-Bike. They brought us over, they gave us a short introduction, they put us in our leathers, helmets, and they said, we would like you to take this bike down this runway, put the brakes on, and brake into this huge sand area. And we were basically going in there on faith. We, 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 we knew we were going to fall down. We thought we'd try it. We went in there, and the ABS worked in the sand, stopped our bike without us falling down, and that was a huge breakthrough for motorcycling. Like all BMW motorcycles, the K-Bike is built at the BMW factory in Berlin. From the outside, you never think the building dates all the way back to 1939. On the inside, it's the most modern motorcycle factory anywhere. On one end, you have a bunch of bins and boxes and parts, and the other end, you're, they're rolling them off and starting them up and checking out the engine to make sure it doesn't leak in oil. So, uh, fascinating thing. The engine gets put together, and then the, the frame, you know, comes together, and then the body parts go on it. There's an assembly process that can be analyzed and is rational. an assembly process that is uniquely rational in a BMW sort of way. Lots of people, lots of high-tech machinery, um, and it just looks very German. Uh, it's like the inside of a watch in there, it seems like to me. More than 40 computer-controlled machines grind, mill, and polish engine parts to extremely critical tolerances. There's no other way to build a motorcycle engine that can run for 200,000 miles or more without missing a beat. There's just something about the BMW factory that's just a little bit more, it's hard to, hard to describe. You just have the feeling of precision while you're in there. This machine is a giant mechanical equivalent of an electric toothbrush. It hones, or fine polishes, the cylinder liners inside the crankcase before the engine moves to one of five highly specialized automated workstations. This is where state-of-the-art robots apply a bead of sealing material on engine parts with a precision that could never be matched or repeated by human hands. Everything always happened um, in a precise way there, more so than some other factories. But people still do all of the final engine assembly. 145 people work in the engine department, and on average, it takes two hours to build a K-bike motor from start to finish. Throughout the building process, wireless data transmissions monitor everything to ensure what most companies would call quality control. At BMW, they call it pride. Everybody in that factory knows they're making BMW motorcycles. They're proud of it. They are riders themselves. They, most of the people I know there have been there for many, many years. The frame is another major step in the K-bike build process. Two lasers cut out 20 different pieces of aluminum. An automated jig holds all the different parts together in perfect alignment, and then moves the frame into position so robots can weld it all together. Germans have long had a reputation for achievements in science and engineering. The factory paint shop is a great example. Here, they combine Teutonic technology with classic German craftsmanship. With water streaming down the wall to control overspray and air pollution, five computer-operated robots paint 70 different shaped parts in one of more than 30 colors. 
but the pinstripes on BMWs are all done by hand. They're not the type of brush that you're used to from watercolors, where you have a long wooden part and then just a tiny little brush. It's almost half and half, and the brush has, actually has to hold a lot of paint. And so you get the right consistency, and it's a very long brush, the hairs. And you lay it on, and then you pull it. And you have to do it consistently, you have to have the right pressure. You push too hard and you get a squish. You push too little and it, the line gets narrower. And the ladies there do this by hand. It's the combination of humans and machinery and noise and uh, the close confines of the old brick building. and. It's just kind of a neat place to visit. Kind of a dichotomy of old and new stuffed into one really cool place. An electric suspension track is the key to BMW's final assembly line. The large yellow structures, called C-hooks, automatically move each bike. Each technician can program his station to put the C-hook and bike at whatever position they find the most comfortable. It's just funny to see motorcycles hanging from a from a rack and moving slowly and becoming, uh, going from bare frame to bare frame with an engine to wheels to bodywork and then a finished product so quickly and um, all these people scurrying around and attaching parts here and there. As the bikes move through the factory, wheels are installed, exhaust systems fitted then air ducts that will help the engine breathe. Bolts are screwed and tightened. And then, each new motorcycle gets its first taste of fuel. Finally, the remaining body panels from the paint shop are installed, and after spending 100 minutes on a C-hook, a brand new BMW is ready for its final test. The bikes come off the, the, the line, they go into a proof, uh, what a, a testing center, they're put on the rollers, they make sure everything works. Uh, uh, there are interesting parts that you see as a layman that you go, wow, I didn't know they do that. The computer readout says, proof stand bereit, which translates to, the test stand is ready. This is the first time the new bike has been off its giant C hook. Now, it's in the BMW test chamber where one of nine people who spend their entire day riding new bikes will run the new motorcycle for up to 60 miles without it ever moving an inch. The entire time, computers measure and monitor everything from the engine's performance to how well BMW's patented heated hand grips will keep your fingers warm if it's cold outside. The Germans have always had a more practical approach towards, uh, shall we say, their entire life. I mean, the climate up there is pretty harsh, and so you want something that will start in the winter, and you like heated hand grips on a motorcycle. In recent years, BMW's practical approach towards life has been shared between BMW motorcycles and BMW automobiles. Designers for bikes and cars work side by side. BMW is the only company in the world that has automotive and motorcycle design under one roof. Where you are now is actually right next to the automotive studio. And this was started in 1993. Um, we took the motorcycle design group, which was then separate, and we combined them. One idea, of course, was to make the best uh, use of our resources, but it was also to inspire and to have competition. And so if our colleagues come by and say, what are you doing that for? Could you do it this way? I think the biggest thing is just that cultural rub off. It really does have a big effect on how they put motorcycles together and how they design them and how they build them. And uh, you can tell when you're there. And when you're there, there's only one place to go. Head south from Berlin. In about 425 miles, you'll be in Bavaria.
Like the very first BMW, the latest bikes from the Bayerische Motorenwerke seem most at home in Bavaria. There are countless curving roads that run through fairy tale villages as they lead their way up to the Alps. It is as close to uh, you know a, 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 a dream of motorcycling as you can find because the Alpine roads are just superb. I mean, they just twist around. They just twist around forever because the Alps, my God, they make a a big loop there of about a thousand miles from the French Riviera over to Slovenia. And you just go on endlessly uh, sort of going around curves. Curving roads that connect to the other part of BMW's homeland that's uniquely German. The Autobahn a highway that has long stretches without any speed limit. If you haven't ridden the Autobahn, you've got to do it. I'm, I'm going right around 135 miles an hour, because why not? I mean, it, it, you're allowed to, and let's go. So we're going, and up in front of us, a big Mercedes wagon comes on the freeway up in front of us, and we kind of catch up to it, and there's some kids sitting in the back of the wagon facing backward, and their dad must have said, wave goodbye, because they both went like this, and the wagon went whoop away from us, and I went, God bless Germany. <laughs> Seriously, unbelievable. The newest generation of BMW K bikes were built to be Autobahn burners. The K1200R has 167 horsepower, the biggest engine BMW has ever put into a production motorcycle. K1200R is an amazing bike. It's the most powerful naked bike in the world. Um, it looks gnarly, it is very BMW-like, it has the technology you'd expect from us. It has a certain comfort you would not expect of a motorcycle that looks that scary. The thing that, that stands out to most of us about the K1200R is that they didn't take power out of it. You know, they made a naked bike that make, that's got a big hit to it. The newest K bikes, like the newest BMW cars, have a tiny computer chip that electronically limits their top speed to 155 miles an hour. Uh, it's very turbine like, it's very smooth. I'm trying not to use the cliches rocket like or missile like. It's a real kick in the behind, gets off and goes. Uh, I had it down in Spain, and uh, I'm, I'm sure they have a speed limit, but it wasn't very prevalent where I was, and it just goes very, very quickly. BMW is loved for their strength, intuitiveness, aggression, and chasing technologies. They really are trying to push motorcycling uh, forward and make it, make it more rider friendly, make the performance better, make the fuel efficiency better. In 2001, BMW used its technology to create a very un-BMW-like motorcycle. The new bike was called the F800. It had a two-cylinder, liquid-cooled, parallel twin engine and used a belt to drive the back wheel. There was no outcry from BMW purists because the new bike wasn't built for them. The F800 targeted entry-level riders who would be new to the BMW brand. The F800's great fun because it's much lighter. It's a different class of bike. It's a middle, middle class bike. So it also offers an even more nimble character to it. The ride is, is much lighter. I'm a big fan of the BMW 800 series. The parallel twin, I like those bikes. I like that engine layout. It makes a tight, compact unit. It's nice to see BMW experimenting with it. The 
F800 ST is the sport touring model of BMW's new midsize line of motorcycles. Its engine produces 85 horsepower, a little more than half of what a new K-Bike cranks out. But as an entry-level model, the F800 series sells for about half the price of a K-Bike. The F800 ST is quite different than that bike. It doesn't, it doesn't feel as, as substantial. It's very nimble, it's very light, and offers you comfort that you might not expect from a bike that size. The K1200R and the F800 ST are very different than previous BMW motorcycles, and yet they share the same style of engineering, innovation, and purpose that all BMWs have had since 1923. As a small company, BMW made a lot of innovations in the history, but I think it was the only chance if you are a little bit faster than the big companies. So it's not important to be big, it's important to be fast with innovations, with trends, and so on. BMW has led technology, and they have in cars, and they have in bikes, and you always wonder what next year is going to bring from BMW. The surprise for 2008 was a completely new motorcycle. Called the S1000RR, this BMW was a major break from any motorcycle design the company had ever created. The S1000RR has a four-cylinder engine unlike anything BMW has ever built. It makes 190 horsepower. Like most other sport motorcycles, it uses a chain to drive the rear wheel. BMW built the S1000RR to go racing at the World Superbike level. Brand new buyer for it because most of us that are interested in that performance, we look to the racetrack. Whatever BMW builds, two things will remain the same. BMWs are motorcycles that have always been created with innovation and technology. That's what made BMW successful in the first place, when the company was forced into the motorcycle business just to stay alive. And over the years, when times have changed and BMW needed a new model to revive their line, they relied on new designs and new ways of doing things. There's only one thing about BMW that has never changed. Their motorcycles always seem the most at home riding in the beautiful mountain roads of Bavaria, the place where the Bayerische Motor in Werke was born. There are things that you can experience on a motorcycle. You can't feel that way anywhere else. So, you know, if, if you're on a, your favorite uh, road and you get the flow, it works that day. It's just bang, 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 it's smooth, it's, it's powerful. Uh, you can't explain that. Well, it's going into a corner, and, you know, it's not it. Everything happens at once. You smell the flowers, you, you see the sun, you, you know, see your favorite pub going by. It's all of those things happening at once. 